Bom dia a todas e a todos. Em primeiro lugar, eu queria apresentar as minhas desculpas pessoais pelos dez minutos de atraso. É inevitável, às vezes, nessa cidade, mas enfim. E eu é, gostaria de apresentar e convidar para a mesa o professor é, Benjamin é, Titanbaum, que é professor de etnomusicologia, que é algo para nós aqui muito diferente, né? e Assuntos Internacionais, da Universidade do Colorado. Ele é autor de Leões do Norte, Sons do Novo Nacionalismo Radical Nórdico, um estudo etnográfico de nacionalismos radicais na Escandinávia e do livro Guerra pela Eternidade, o um ensaio sobre a influência da escola perennialista sobre uh, figuras contemporâneas associadas à extrema-direita. Como todos viram né, essa apresentação, já, mas é, eu gostaria, é com enorme prazer, e nós vamos apre aprender muito com essa apresentação. Could you come? <risos> muito obrigada. Yes, you can hear me. Okay, uh, and it's okay if if, if I speak English. Um, I will do my best to speak clearly and slowly. Um, we will have a question and answer session afterwards, and and please feel free to use that time to ask me if you don't understand something that I that I'm saying today. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to to the University of Sao Paulo. Thank you to IBI, uh, the Instituto uh, Brasil Israel. Um, for, for inviting me to speak to you today. Um, I've been here in Brazil for about four months. Uh, I've been speaking a lot. I've been traveling a lot and enjoying this country. Um, and when I travel and I speak, it's sometimes expected that I deliver, especially in a university setting, that I deliver a paper, a finished product with an argument, a thesis that I will try and persuade you uh, to, to follow. Um, but that's not what I enjoy doing these days. Instead, what I like to do is present you with material that I am studying right now, material that has open questions, um, and to invite you into a conversation with me afterwards. So that's, that's what I'm going to do. It's also commonly expected, uh, especially in Brazil, that I will talk about Olava de Cavalho. Um, uh, yes, a figure who, of course, you may know that I wrote about and met and spoke with on, on a number of occasions um, and came to know, and it was a contentious relationship, as some of you may know. Um, but that also is not what I am going to do today, even though Olavo's legacy and his work hinges on what I have to talk about. Instead, what I would like to do is begin the conversation today by turning back, uh, turning back to 1850 um, and to the work of a figure, uh, Richard Wagner. Uh, I'm more accustomed, as, uh, as, as was mentioned, I'm a music scholar as well as a scholar of politics. And there are few figures who embody both those pursuits more than Richard Wagner. Uh, a celebrated, innovative, and, and I do not hesitate to say, uh, incredibly accomplished musician and artist, and also a well-known anti-Semite. Um, who not only harbored um, antipathies toward Jews, but committed them to paper in his writings. And the chief expression of Wagner's antipathy toward Jews came in, uh, in an article he originally wrote under a pseudonym in 1850, initially, uh, Judaism in Music. Um, and it was reissued in 18, uh, 1869. Now, uh, one thing that Richard Wagner wanted to do in this pamphlet was prevent a change that he thought was taking place to music and elite musical life in Europe. He thought at the time that music was potentially flourishing on the cusp of, of having new, uh, creating new discoveries for itself, breaking into new territory, developing, progressing in new ways, but something was stopping that progression. The thing that was stopping that progression was, apparently to him, according to him, Jews. 
And in this particular essay, he set out to explain what it was about Jews that was so difficult and problematic for, for musical life. Um, now in this text, I'm not sure, yes, we can see this up here. Uh, the characterization of Jews seems to have multiple parts, but they all center on one theme. Um, one of the themes that he, he addressed in his text was the, the physicality, the corporal, the physiology of Jews. His claim was on the surface that Jews were ugly and that Jews being ugly prevented them from uh, serving adequately as actors on the stage. And as you see in the top quote that I put there, um, and I'll read it aloud, if we hold a man to be exteriorly disqualified by race for any artistic presentation whatever, whatsoever, that is to say if someone is disqualified because of their physical appearance from appearing in one artistic pursuit, it follows that we should also regard him as unfit for any artistic pronouncement. That is to say, expressing something, creating something external to themselves. In other words, that beautiful art can only come from a beautiful body, and those in possession of non-beautiful bodies are not able to produce beautiful art. Um, it would seem to be, on the surface, in other words, a pretty crude description and theory of art and of humanity. But it's more nuanced than that. Uh, we see in the rest of his, of his writings um, that uh, Jews are too fixated on the practical matters and alien toward the immaterial and the spiritual. Uh, we, we hear that Jews as, as uh, economists, essentially, as commodifiers can only interact with art by commodifying it, by turning it into, as we see in the third quote here, an article of exchange. But they can't actually make the art itself. And then he says, uh, as well, if you hear a Jew speak, you will hear uh, no quality, no warmth, just babble or blabber in this case. Uh, what comes across in these writings uh, is a portrayal of Jews that is not only physically unappealing, but actually averse to appearance and associated more with words than with images. And that became especially, especially, um, uh, especially uh, pronounced later in Wagner's works. Um, he saw an opposition between non-Jews, their associations on the left, uh, with Jews, their associations on the right. Uh, that whereas non-Jews could possess image, appearance, body, quality, Jews could not. Opposite images, they were only words. Opposite passion, they were only reason. Opposite spirit, let's say manifest in an artwork, they could only be bureaucracy, an economy. And to summarize all of that with a main point, opposite the actual source, or content of art, they could only be mediation of art, talk about art, money about art, institutions that house art, but not actually content itself. And in a note, uh, in his 1869 version, we see all of this brought together. He imagines, uh, he starts to consider the, the influence in, in what he saw as the encroachment of Jews into theater. And he said that it was like this. One's impression is as though the savior had been cut out of a painting of the crucifixion and replaced by a Jewish demagogue. And I'm not sure the word demagogue, demagogo, demagogujo, mm -hmm. something like that, if it has the same associations in Portuguese, but in, uh, in German and in English, demagogue also relates to someone who speaks, someone who yells. In other words, that an image, a sacred image, sacred body, uh, would be replaced with Jewish speech. That was the opposition that Wagner had. And thus, when we consider his, his condemnation of Jews more broadly, it actually wasn't so much about Jews per se, it was actually about people who represented mediation, and Jews happened to be the manifestation of that. That's what Wagner was out against. It is a form of anti-Semitism that, that, uh, that prevailed during this particular time in Europe, no doubt, 
um, we saw Jews being criticized as capitalists, as communists, as secularists, as sectarians, as being almost everything that could make up the social transformation of Europe in the 1800s and the 1700s. This would all manifest, of course, in the protocols of the elders of Zion later on, where Jews seemed to do everything. But what were they doing? They were a simple manifestation of modernity. And complaints against modernity found Jews as a tool. But for Wagner, he did something special. He focused on one particular aspect of Judaism, and it was their alleged role in mediating, mediating between people and actual authenticity. In the case of art, authentic art. Jews were not able to have passion, spirit, spirituality, content. They could only be the mediation around it. And in his case, a focus on language, opposite image, became paramount. Now, this core idea that we saw with Wagner has been in my mind so much these past years because I think it is replicating itself. In order to understand that, I'm going to ask for your patience with me. Uh, the word source that I use here, uh, the parallel in Portuguese would be fonte, right? Correct? And I don't quite know all the nuances of that word, fonte in Portuguese, but I mean source to, me, to, to, to encompass quite a bit. I want source to encompass not only authentic art, spirituality, meaning, passion, substance, the things that matter in life, but also our highest ideals. Because if we think of source in that broader sense, we can see also a similar dynamic, principally coming from the political right, wherein there is urgency about beliefs um, that our sources are being denied us by mediators, and that the goal of modern political life should be to erase the mediation and capture the actual source, thought you. Now, what I'm going to talk to you about, the examples I'm going to give uh, are coming from different places. Richard Wagner was an artist. And, and uh, in a neutral sense, I would call him a public intellectual. Um, but we can also see this, this basic way of thinking with entrepreneurs, with media personalities, in addition to political actors. And to start with, I would turn to a figure who embodies a lot of those roles, uh, a figure named Peter Thiel. Does anyone in the room, anyone heard of Peter Thiel before? Okay. Um, a major funder behind Facebook, Twitter, PayPal, Instagram, um, Donald Trump, J.D. Vance, Blake Masters, a range of tech products and populist conservatives in the United States. Multi-multi-billionaire uh, responsible for a great number of projects. But in 2008, um, he began to uh, produce his own form of public intellectualism. And what he said, and it's ironic, given his involvement in politics, was that he no longer trusted in politics as a tool to change and a tool for good. Uh, why didn't he think that politics could do anything meaningful? Well, he felt that the majority of society was alien and hostile to the things that he cared most about. The thing he cared most about, as you see in this, in this quote, was freedom. He believed that the ultimate goal of society and human life was to allow individuals to be as free as possible, and if they did that, they would create better, more advanced, more beautiful things in this world. And so if society and politics were opposed to that, if freedom was going to be subject to and ultimately a victim of public opinion, then the goal for someone like him was to remove himself from public opinion find a way to escape politics. One of the projects that he embarked on in order to do this was something called seasteading. In 2008, an organization, uh, uh, the Seasteading Institute, was founded, a partnership between Peter Thiel with his money and the grandson of Milton Friedman, uh, a known libertarian voice in the United States. And their goal was to create a floating city or lots of floating cities out at sea beyond the jurisdiction of a state. And the fact that it was outside the bounds of a state was certainly beneficial. That's one part of it. But the second equally important part of this is that these 
particular states would not be democratic. Put that in different terms, it would be outside the reach of the collective. Your actions would not be subject to the consensus of the people around you. Instead, certain laws would, would, would be set in stone. You could choose whether or not you would come to the seastead or not, but beside that, you would not have a civic responsibility um, and you would not have any democratic imperative. This was the dream uh, of, of Peter Thiel. Um, it never came to fruition, and after COVID, the idea of being at the far, far end of a supply chain has, has I think, appealed less and less to people for obvious reasons. Um, but in this case, we see a similar, a similar dynamic whereby a source, a source goal, something authentic, in this case, freedom, is seen as being off limits, bounded by a mediator, um, state and society. And the goal of Peter Thiel was to try and find a way to circumvent it, to imagine life without that mediator breakthrough. Um, Another thing that Peter T, another person who was, who was imagined escape in this way, or exit, is this guy. Do you know this guy? Who is this guy? Elon Musk, yes, Elon Musk. A protege of Peter Thiel, the connection between them is not simply conceptual uh, or abstract. The two of them knew each other and Peter Thiel hired Elon Musk early in his career. Now, Elon Musk's version of exit, the seasteading that I spoke about earlier, focuses instead on cyberspace, um, cryptocurrency being an iteration of that, but imagining the ways that, that the internet might free creativity, free the individual, both from the state, but also from public consensus. And if you do that, more, things, more good things can happen. Of course, in Elon Musk's case, also space exploration exists as, as an iteration of this, uh, a parallel to the seascape. You can, escape, uh, you can escape the bounds of government by traveling to Mars and creating a new colony there that would be free and undemocratic, expressly undemocratic. Um, but Elon Musk, I'd like to focus on another project of his briefly um, that, uh, that explores the same idea from another perspective. One of his many projects, it's not just Starlink, not just now Twitter or, or um, Tesla and space exploration, but it's also a, a company called Neuralink, um, which was founded in 2016, announced in 2017. Neuralink uh, is expressly devoted to exploring body human computer interfaces. And if you can see on the icon here, much of their interest has been uh, in, explore, in installing chips and computers and interacting with the human brain. Initially, the, the purpose for this was to address certain neurological medical problems. Um, Musk wanted to put his considerable economic resources behind research in this, in this way. But he has a grander vision, of course, um, and it's one that he spoke with on a popular conservative uh, uh, podcast in the United States, the Joe Rogan podcast. I'd like to request, if I may, um, a, a brief clip of their conversation he, as he talks about what he thinks is, uh, is at the forefront. Thirty-one ten. Yes. Straight on. How to use some new universal language and essentially like a, a Rosetta Stone, and something you've done with that interprets your thoughts and you can convey your thoughts with no room for interpretation. It's clear, very clear, where you know what a person's saying and you can tell them what you're saying. Very quickly, uh, 
least for the first iterations, first few iterations, is getting the use. Like, I, I know that Google has uh, the, the, some of their pixel buds have the ability to interpret languages and go, huh? Like, yep. Yeah, you can hear it and it'll, it'll, it'll play things back to you in whatever language you choose. So it's just something along those lines. Yeah, for the first few iterations. Well, the first few iterations, I mean, it's, what, what I've pulled out is like kind of over, over time, it was, it was a lot of fun. And the first few iterations, re really in the first few versions, what we were really trying to do is just create software for Android. Um, so it's sort of just like, like don't, don't, don't worry about the stuff that's just on. This, this, this will take a while. How many years? Before you have five. Yeah. The, the, the pro development continues to accelerate from maybe a five year period of time. That's quick. That's really quick. But not best case scenario. Thank you. To summarize that, their voices aren't always especially clear, but there is a goal for, on, uh, on the part of Elon Musk to create connections between people's brains and allow, allow us to communicate with each other without language um, and allow the transference, allow the communication of, of private thoughts, essentially, back and forth. Why would one want to do such a thing? Um, the idea would be that you could, you could attain greater truth, greater fidelity, that language is this clunky, imprecise, inaccurate uh, uh, crutch that we all use to communicate with one another. That our thoughts are in fact, in some, some other dimension, our thoughts are more precise, uh, more raw, better. And we have to compromise every time we put them into language in order to, in order to speak with someone else. So why not, in other words, why not try to eliminate that middle stage, um, and and get to the actual the actual thoughts, the actual intentions. So there is a case study. Now, um, this is not the only way in which this figure, Elon Musk, who is increasingly becoming a figure associated with the right, uh, has tried to eliminate mediation. It's not just the exploration to space. It's not just this Neuralink software and design. Um, it's also, of course, media. Um, he owns Twitter, and the political agenda with Twitter in many cases is to try and do something similar to this, to eliminate media filtration of political discourse and thereby allow a, a grander uh, freedom of speech and allow political positions that are being oppressed or suppressed to express themselves. Now, when he operates in that particular sphere, in the sphere of Twitter, um, he is aligning himself more with a particular expressive and political model um, that we uh, know in Brazil and in the United States with the name populism, populismo. Now, populism, I, I assume, are there political scientists here? Many, okay, no one is raising their hands like we're all political scientists. Uh, it's, it's, it's one, to me, uh, a taken for granted observation that populism as a political ideology is a very thin political ideology. Right? It doesn't have a lot of content to it. Um, but to the extent that populism is a thing, is an actual thing, it tends to build around this opposition, a, a, a proclaimed opposition between the people and the establishment. And to claim that there is an establishment in society that is inherently opposed to the real people. Um, the way to correct that divide is to find a leader who breaks out of the establishment who can commune with, live with, be with, communicate with the people directly. Um, and thus these media practices surround, uh, just like what we were hearing with, with Elon Musk and Twitter, uh, they would play an essential role in this. Bypass Folia, bypass O Globo, bypass CNN, go straight to the people, speak yourself in a live social media feed without mediators. This is what would allow the populist leader to actually be, uh, to be at one with the people who they are following. Um, and if this takes place, if this takes place, then the distances between the elite and the people will, will disintegrate, and what will be one in the process is, again, truth. 
Um, it's uh, a different type of truth, of course, than what we would hear with Richard Wagner, a different type of truth than we would hear um, from Peter Thiel or in Elon Musk's Neuralink project. Um, the truth in that case would be uh, having someone in power who understands you and acts in the ways that you want them to act. Uh, but in order for this to take place, a treacherous medium needs to be erased, that of the media, the media establishment in this case. Um, so these are four examples that I give you to, to think about ways in which uh, these particular actors actually are adopting at a deeper level uh, a common structural conceptual framework. Um, and it has to do with a striving toward uh, access to non-mediation and access to, to real sources. Um, now, what are the things that they that these particular case studies highlight as a source, as a font here, something that's uh, worth striving toward or gaining? Well, it's freedom, truth, community. Um, but all of those all of those entities, each of them needs to have a sort of uh, an addition, a, a suffix added to it, or a prefix rather. Um, authentic freedom, authentic truth, authentic community, not a fake community, but the real people of populism could be, could be uh, um, highlighted in that case. Uh, mediations, all of them that are standing in the way, however, we see state, social consensus, words, language at, at large, and media, um, which itself is a conveyor of words and language. So what do we make of this? There are a couple points I, I would leave as I transition to a question and answer session and would like to have more of a conversation with you all, but a couple points. One of them, I'm invited here by the, uh, by the, uh, the Institute for Braz Brazilian and Is Israeli Relations. Uh, one of them concerns the history of anti-Semitism and brings Wagner's original words into context. Um, Jews are associated with all of these things in, in, in the world of mediation. Wagner associates them with words in a somewhat esoteric sense, opposite image. Um, but the association with words is an association that ties to states, to publics, to media concerns, to consensus, to discourse, to rational process and rational uh, considerations, opposite passionate truth, opposite authentic truth, eternal truth. Um, but also Jews are associated as with, with the media. Um, and all of these entities, in their turn, are also expressions of modernity. These are all uh, institutions uh, that become codified and instrumentalized in modern society in new ways. So it adds to our understanding, I think, uh, of, of anti-Semitism and what, what modern anti-Semitism is. But here's another uh, topic of, of concern and consideration. Uh, when if, if you turn back, I think it is most clear with Elon Musk's example. If you imagine an existence where we were able to communicate with one another uh, without words, if we were able to send our thoughts uh, back and forth to one another, what would that be like? Are there any linguists here? Any, any scholars of, of linguistics? There's a huge debate, and there has been criticism already of Elon Musk on this point, a debate about whether or not that information would actually be thought. Um, plenty of scholars of language can uh, contend that our understanding, our ideas are in fact coded by language. The source and the mediation are the same thing. Um, that the thoughts, if they were not in some way framed in terms of language, they would be unintelligible uh, to other people and they would be unintelligible to ourselves. We think we would be arriving at authenticity, but instead we'd be arriving at utter chaos. Using that as a metaphor, I would encourage you all to think about the other examples that I gave you. The one of music without words, of image without words, of democracy, or, or let's say of freedom without community. Freedom without some obligation to consensus and the people living around you. Uh, or democracy without a media, without a media to in some way, yes, filter and process and also make sense of words that are being spoken in society. Would a similar dynamic attend? Would the source, the community, the truth, the freedom in any way be intelligible 
Or would it also be like the unprocessed ideas in, in the Neuralink example, would it also be chaos? That's my talk, everyone. Um, but I hope it's an invitation to have a conversation with you. I'm awfully interested to hear your questions. You may ask me questions about Olava G. Cavallo if you want to as well. That's fine. <laughs> so, but thank you so much. Wow, thank you so much, Benjamin. It was really, <laughs> I don't know what the best word to say, but I'm shocked. <laughs> Very, very nice. Thank you so much. So I'm going to give the floor to the students first. Maybe Please. if you want to, uh, we can pick three questions or two, and then we go. Uh, so please, if, can you come here? Because we are. Oh, the other one is here. Yeah, OK. Obrigada, Murilo. Uh, please say your name, where you're from, and etc. Test. Hi, uh, thank you, Benjamin. It, it was fascinating, uh, the reflection you bought. Uh, I'm Diogo. I'm a PhD student here in Niger. I'm studying the, the crossroad between technology and the new disinformation campaigns. And my question to you is, uh, wasn't this framework like always in place since the past, since like the old times? And have you done any reflection about the role of the new social media tech doing this type of mediation, right? Like boosting, reinforcing. That's why we have started to see this type of phenomenon each time more. Right. Oh, oh, oh right. I don't know if start by speaking. Yes. yes. Um, it's it's a wonderful question. Another element of this of this dynamic is, of course, w when the entire play is deceptive, right? When you think that mediation has been eliminated, but in fact, it's all just a, a sort of aesthetic game <laughs> that's going on. And social media is a great example of that, where you, you, it sells itself as being direct, unmediated contact between people and other people speaking. Um, but in fact, it, it's not because of the algorithms, because of the boosting, because of the silencing, which we have seen take place, uh, I think, in these past months in fairly dramatic ways on Twitter, right? Um, it's, it's a question, the, the roots of that, maybe it's because I'm a music scholar in a sense, but I'm, I'm keen to see the roots of that tied also to Richard Wagner's aesthetic movement, romantic nationalism in Europe. Part of the, the ideology of that movement was uh, that European intellectuals are going to turn back to their local rural populations. Um, if you are in France, if you're in Denmark, if you're in Sweden and Norway, uh, you look back to the rural population in your society to find what was true and authentic about your society, about your identity that was destroyed with cosmopolitanism and modernity, right? So turn back to the roots. The problem was is that that ostensibly, allegedly unvarnished core or source was itself a, a construction, right? When, uh, when Edvard Grieg wrote music, when you, when you had these famous painters who painted the peasants, the poor, poor peasants in the countryside, it was such a selective image of it. They didn't include all the lice. They didn't include the death, the lawlessness, the poverty, the broken bodies, all of the misery, all of the ignorance, all of the, the crushing institutions. Um, that was all cleaned from this romanticized image. It was a construction. Um, so it maybe it's a stretch, but the connection that I, I see between that and Twitter is that w we have to view unmediation, authenticity, purity, as being a constructed entity in both cases. Um, in the artistic world, it's, it's, it's clean. We have something material, a painting we can look at that is supposed to represent something else and we can decide whether it represents it. But in the media world, we're talking about an ideology, an ideology of unmediated communication that we can compare to a reality if we have the tools to do it. Right? But there's a variation in each case. So.
Hello, thanks, Ben, for your astonishing uh, uh, speech and presentation. I'm Johnny, I'm a PhD student here at uh, this institute. And my question to you is regarding deny, uh, denialism. Can we put denialism in such a context? And how do you see that, please? C could I ask you to elaborate a little bit more? Deni denialism can mean lots of, yeah, lots of things. Yeah, denialism, because we see that the far right movement here in Brazil, at least, uh, is based on denialism. Denying science, denying media, denying vaccines. And it seems to be uh, a sort of pillar of such movement. So I just want to hear your thoughts about that, if you could. So in, in a lot of those cases, it, it does relate. The connection that I would see there it relates to the condemnation of the mediator. right? So if, um, if we were to take a lot of the Brazilian far right actors as examples, the condemnation of science, of media, um, of government, has to do with their relationship to truth. For example, a particular account of what truth is that is incorrect, and if you find a way to bypass all of those institutions, you might get at the actual truth. Um, so here, I'll, I'll mention his name first, with Olavo. He offered, ostensibly, an unmediated uh, channel to philosophical greats, to, to scientific knowledge that wasn't contaminated by institutional science, that wasn't contaminated by institutional philosophy. Um, and uh, it, it's, there's an anti-modernism to all that as well, to say that all of these institutions, they came about fairly recently. Um, they're, they're tied to, to a broader process of statecraft and, and to internationalism and to cosmopolitanism. Uh, all of which can corrupt and and build an elite that's that's hostile to you. So I think um, I think you would absolutely, at a very in, in a very basic sense, see uh, eliding and finding a way to to transcend the mediator in that case, um, being invested with an idea also of of truth and the importance of truth. Mm -hmm. Wonderful question. Uh, Benjamin, thank you for a really provocative thought. Um, uh, I, I'm Cristiani Lucena. I'm an associate professor here at the Institute. Um, and I, I would love to hear more about your current project, the project associated with what you're presenting, which I understand is at very early stages. And, uh, but um, what is your intuition? What is bringing you to Wagner, for example, right? And um, associated to that, but, but uh, not directly, I'd love to hear a little bit more about what's happening at the musical slash public intellectual scene um, contemporary to Wagner, perhaps even later. I was thinking about Satie, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Satie. And uh, to what extent uh, there were others um, that were also engaging in this, in, in putting their thoughts in, in words, not musical notes, but words, and how that dialogue would perhaps even offer counterpoints to, to Wagner, right? And that, that's coming from somebody who's utterly ignorant on the subject, but find it fascinating, yeah? Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor, for those uh, for that question. Um, briefly about my well, it's all it's all related. Um, the, what, what you just asked is related to my current work. My 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 research now is based on a couple of just peculiar observations that I've had. Um, one is that far right music making today has fewer and fewer words, and that's what kind of got me going on this path. <laughs> Um, and that's after the 1980s and the 1990s were, were really a heyday of far-right music with lots of words and simple words. Um, white power music, skinhead music, um, neo-Nazi music that was built around a chorus with a simple message. The, the keystone, the flagship song is called White, white Power. Um, white Power for England, White Power Today. Um, we gotta do it before it gets too late. Very simple, word-based. The music is boring. The music sucks, right? It's it's bad. It's all about the words. Fast forward until today, the past decade, words have dis have left in their place. There's electronic dance music. There's ethereal EDM 
variations, um, and there's a lot of vocables. Does that word exist in, in Portuguese? Do you know what vocables is? La, 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 do, 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 which is actually something a little more than non-words. It's a pantomiming of words. It's, it's marking the absence of speech in a way, performing the absence of speech. So that was peculiar to me. It was, it was peculiar at the same time that a lot of far-right actors uh, seemed to be wanting to talk a lot about the importance of passion and humanity and, um, uh, and the extra-rational and the symbolic which are strange things for, for politicians to talk about. When Ernesto Araujo, when he spoke for the, um, for the Heritage Club in DC, before, shortly before he, he ends up being fired, he gave a speech not about international relations, not about international politics or policy or trade, and he gave a speech about the need for the West to regain its symbols, which is really weird, <laughs> right? It's very strange. So it's that, it's that interest in the numinous, it's the interest in the erratic in terms of aura, in quality over quantity, in the inquantifiable, um, in, in spirit and spirituality. I'm interested in knowing wh why that is appealing to the right and how it's all being used right now. That's the project. Um, now to go back, if, if you think, think of, of Wagner, that this shows in a certain in a certain instance that an anti-modern, a reactionary political cause has for a long time been suspicious of the rational and been drawn to the spiritual, right? And, and spirituality being prized with being more authentic than the modern, the contemporary, and the rational. That's what Wagner showed. Um, you mentioned Satie, who's a, a French composer known for his piano pieces. What is, what is distinct about Satie is that he would write in the actual score. You not only have musical notes, but you have phrases. My favorite one in one of his piano pieces, he says in the middle of a long, um, a long arpeggio, he says, wonder about yourself. <laughs> so you should be playing, it's like, oh, okay, okay, I'll wonder. Um, um, and they're, they're very amusing, but they're very charming, all the, the phrases that he used. Um, and, and yet they also seem to me failed attempts at something. Um, it's as if uh, someone is wanting to communi communicate something with music that they're not entirely able to, and they go to words because they're frustrated, but the words are, are, are going to end up on the, uh, uh, also outside of what they're trying to say. I'm sorry to speak so abstractly here. But um, the, the, the words were, were themselves almost non-denotational text. Their semantics, their syntax was, was always awkward. Their meaning was always poetic almost. So yes, they were words, but they were, they were less words than other words, if you catch my meaning. Richard Wagner, when he was, when he was criticizing Jews, and he said that they had, you know, yes, they can speak, they have speech, they have ugly speech, but they have speech. One thing he still said they don't have, they don't have poetics. They can't speak in poetry because poetry is this use of language to get beyond language. It's po poetry is something that can't be translated into prose. It has meaning that is extra rational. And you see in Sati almost an effort to, to try, to try and achieve something with words that doesn't happen. Um, so that's, that's, that's my initial res response to it is, um, there was a moment in, in European musical history also where the, the inability for music to speak became a problem, and, it, and it's tied into this, this era. Some people said that music is inherently melancholy. Um, melancholy not in the sense that it's sad, but in the sense that it's speechless. A melancholic is not only sad, but also doesn't speak often. Uh, melancholy exists in Portuguese? Uh, saudade is this other, yeah. Melancholia, melancholia, okay. Um, that they don't speak and that that was the, the destiny and the problem of music. And it becomes a problem in a modern age when to speak is to exist. In a democratic society, you don't exist if you don't use voice in an intelligible, an intelligible manner. And so a lot, of, a lot of composers did spend time trying to think about that. I see sati as existing kind of in that gray space, so. It's a difficult, intelligent question. I'm sorry to give you a long answer. <laughs> so. uh, 
So thank you, Professor Taitabon, for your conference. I'm actually a junior undergraduate, and I would like to understand more uh, the dialogue between your early work on perennialism and what you are doing right now, because it seems to me, and I don't know if I'm wrong, that there is a lot of mediation in perennialism. Don't you think that the figures of, I don't know, the Sufi sheikhs or the gurus are kind of mediators to, the, to achieve their source? that is the so-called perennial tradition or the primordial tradition, actually. And don't you think, for example, that René Guénon or Friedrich Schoen are kind of uh, maybe these mediator figures in perennialism? Good, good students. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent question. Uh, yes, part of, the idea, part, of the, part of the idealized state of affairs you would see in, in, in perennialism or traditionalism or traditional school relates to hierarchy. Um, the di one of the distinctions they would say is that you know mediation is fine if the if it's the right people mediating, right? Hierarchy is just fine if the really good people are on top, if the authentic elites are on top, then hierarchy is fine. We live in a topsy turvy, upside down world where where the people on top are should be on the bottom, right? Where an authentic good hierarchy has been inverted, and instead the slaves are the elites and the priests. And the elites, uh, the, the, the true, truly spiritually enlightened people are, are erased by society. So that's one aspect of it. Um, but I would ask you, if you want to see a connection between what I talked about here and traditionalism, political traditionalism, think about it in this way. Think about the consequences of it all. Because um, there's something that Peter Thiel and let's say Steve Bannon or Olavo de Cavallo or Alexander Dugan have in common, and it is anti-politics, anti-politica. Um, it is a belief that in order to achieve a goal, you need to look past and liberate yourself from typical political practice, praxis. Um, that could be just literally voting and investing in politics. Um, that's more so the case in Peter Thiel wanting to imagine a new state, trying to break out. Uh, it could be in disregarding the norms of political behavior, which is more Steve Bannon. Um, you know, to, to behave rashly and, and, and to care less about whether or not um, you are observing rules that your competitors will observe in a political sphere. Um, all of them see a need uh, in, instead to sort of break through the gridlock of modern institutional bureaucracy. Um, and, and traditionalism gives, a, gives a, a justification for that by saying that that modern bureaucracy is not something holy. Um, it's not something that actually sustains society in a way democratic society would say. It says, no, this is a recent, a, a very, very recent and a very foolish and corrupt idea, constitutional democracy. We don't need to treat it like it's sacred get through it as quickly as you can and get to the actual core of society, which is something else. So. Mm -hmm. Hello, my name is Fabio. I'm professor at the Federal University of Sao Paulo. I'm also professor here at the Interna um, Latin American Studies uh, Postgraduate Institute here at USP. I have two points. Uh, the first is that I'm um, uh, well, first, thank you for the thought-provoking presentation, but first thing is that um, um, it strikes me that it, it seems rather uh, very different that in the case of Wagner, mediations, they're kind of blocking, you know, sort of a flourishing of art, as opposed to the case of uh, Elon Musk, where mediations, uh, it's, just, um, it's, it's just like um, instrumental reasoning, um, so I'd like to hear your thoughts on, on what, what does that speak between these different contexts. And the second question would be, uh, where does uh, religion come also in, in, in this conversation? Because um, as I was thinking, just as um, um, the, the person that preceded me, that your, your book speaks a lot or has a lot of interfaces with religion and, and, and it, your presentation that is not um, so I would like to, to hear about that. Right. So for the first, um, the first question, comparing Elon Musk and, Richard, and, and Wagner, um, you're right. That in, in the one case, it's a matter of, of a more instrumental, dry communication, or rather the latter case <laughs> with Elon Musk. 
Um, in, in Wagner's case, it's about, it's about um, being able to come in contact with, produce, contribute to good art. Um, we could see a distinction right there. The, the trouble is, is that uh, the trouble, the connection between the two is that Wagner also thought of art as a process of discovery. And he was also progressive in a certain sense too. Um, what needed, what should be done to German art in his mind was to f go to its original source and elaborate it and allow it to develop and grow. Um, he was in some senses a, a sort of anti-romantic, you could say, although it's the combination of futurism with nostalgia that, that makes this particular historical moment distinct. Um, and to put that in other terms, I think that there is a, a connection in, in Wagner's thinking between what is beautiful and what is true. Um, and I'd venture to guess that in Elon Musk's case, there's a, a similar aesthetic value for development and for truth. That what, uh, what is worthy of doing in this world and in this life, uh, what justifies your time and invention, what is serious work on part of a human being is to advance technologically, is to advance in terms of communication, um, in terms of knowledge. Uh, that motivates, of course, Partially, the, the project to spend you know massive amounts of money trying to go to Mars, trying to get humans to Mars, instead of defeating global poverty, right? Because defeating poverty is might sound nice, but that's not really where his heart lies. He instead wants to see humanity do great things and achieve great feats uh, of, of knowledge and expansion. So, um, uh, so I see. On epistemology, I see a value for truth probably in Richard Wagner and his musical and aesthetics theory, and I also see some aesthetic value for truth and knowledge and science in, in Elon Musk. Uh, the second question, uh, the role of religion in all of this. Um, briefly, I do see uh, in, uh, in Wagner, someone could make the case that what, what, was, what was occurring is simply uh, an older form of Christian anti-Semitism by which the Jews had, had you know, corrupted and prevented the full force of Christ's salvation to the world um, by, their, by, by, their religious, by their religious inequities and, and, and religious flaws. Um, it's almost as if he took that older version of anti-Semitism and instead of Christianity or, or Christ's salvation, put aesthetic value in that place. You know, pull pull that out and put in a, put an aesthetic pursuit instead of a spiritual pursuit there. So, um, so it 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 lives there. In in the case of traditionalism, to look at that from a different lens, a lot of traditionalist figures, contemporary perennialists, would look at the world today and say that um, that it is modern society. It is a reign of quantity in versions democratic or communistic. Um, it is materialism that, present, that prevents our society from actually coming in contact with the sacred. Um, it's, it's the belief in progress, a belief that we're always moving forward that prevents us from seeing that the past and eternity is available to us right now. And, and it's in this respect that they also reject the idea of nostalgia um, because they think that they see themselves as nostalgics who beat nostalgia, who can romanticize a past and have it right now. Um, by virtue of, of some, some understandings of cyclic time as opposed to, to linear history. Um, so, so we see that there is, there's a role of a corrupt mediator in these ideas, uh, in these uh, um, notions of traditionalism as well, um, just to give an introduction. Well, uh, thank you, Professor, for your presentation. I was thinking during uh, what you're saying, in another philosopher that was Friedrich Nietzsche, and thinking about him and his connection with Wagner, and he's talked about uh, Wagner, uh, about Till and Elon Musk. One thing that I was thinking is maybe they wanted to reach some kind of way that they can impact comprehension by undermining it and reaching something like the the Ubersmensch, the the superman that maybe uh, Nietzsche wanted to 
to reach maybe think in a in a, in a sort of distorted way like uh, they they were interpreting Wagner and Nietzsche in, in the Nazi period the 1930s well uh, you know no you know well that's my thought about it I don't know if it, if it can um, be a, a way to interpret this kind of thinking thank you Sh sure, I, and, and I'm, I'm so sorry I didn't quite catch the, the question. Could you restate the question, or was it just a... Sure, sure. sure. Um, maybe through this thinking regarding Elon Musk, too, and, uh, and to, uh, re regarding the, um, the way as they can, they want to undermine comprehension. Maybe they wanted to reach something like the Uber's Mensch from Nietzsche. Uh -huh. Okay, got you, yes. Y yes, there is... It's funny if I can I kind of return to Fabio's uh, professor um, question from before. Um, in, in the case, some, sometimes people often ask me, say, my last book was about traditionalists, and they'll say, well, why don't you just call them fascists, right? And one of the distinctions between fascism, um, what comes in Nazi Germany, and, and the traditionalist thinkers is specifically this idea of time and progress. Uh, it, the traditionalists don't believe in progress. They believe in cyclicality. They believe that the greatest, the most important truths about the universe, about ourselves, about humanity, have already been revealed. And they've just been forgotten, and we can get them back. Whereas, whereas someone operating more in the mode of, of progressivism, more doctrinarily, will say, no, that the greatest that we can be and the greatest we can understand is in the future. And, it, and it's a matter of getting there. Um, now, Wagner, um, Nietzsche, uh, Elon Musk, I would presume, even though I've never heard him really formulate a full theory of this, um, obviously, obviously, I think by, by virtue of their actions, belong to this, to this progressive camp, right? They, re they, re they reject the notion of it. It's, it's, uh, it. it's one reason people look at Nazi Germany, for example, and say, yeah, you could say that they romanticize a golden age, but that's not really true. They want inspiration from the past, but they were futuristic. The term that we use in, in the academic literature often for this is palingenesis, uh, which is to the imagined rebirth of, uh, of some past glory. A past golden age can be reborn, and, and we can have not, not this modernity, not an anti-modernity, but an alternative modernity modernity that takes place in the way that we wanted it to, that it could have before it was derailed by X bad mediating force. If it was the Jews, if it was cosmopolitanism, if it was liberalism, if it was the United States, so on and so forth. Um, but it's still a vision for, for change and for the future. And that, that I see more with Nietzsche. Now Nietzsche comments in his other writings, Nietzsche of course is used for everything. He also comments on some of the same Indo-European beliefs in cyclicality, this kind of pre-monotheistic Indo-European um, notion of cyclic time that the traditionalists attach themselves to. But in the, in the grand scheme of things, he believes in trying to create a better human being, this Übermensch, and, and Elon Musk is there as well. Part of the belief, part of what he's striving toward is to create an actual human being that by virtue of interface with computers, can do more than any human being has ever done in the past. All right. So, wonderful question. Um, so, good morning. Um, good morning. Thank you for the lecture, Professor. And, uh, well, I have read your book, uh, War for Eternity, and it's an outstanding book, but it's not about it, which I'm going to talk right now. Uh, I have a question regarding Brazil and Israel relations. Uh, I couldn't call attention that this lecture was uh, sponsored by the Brazilian Israel Institute. And although historically Brazil supports the two state uh, solution for the Israel Israeli Palestine uh, conflict, uh, during the Bolsonaro government, and not just during his government, but the far right here in Brazil is very close to Israel and seem to be ignoring Palestine for the last years. And I want to know what are your talks about this proximity between Brazilian far right and Israel, because it goes kind of against the historical approach that uh, far right is kind of um, 
again, it's kind of antithesis, which is true. But yes. I find it very curious, and I don't have a true answer to this proximity between the far Brazilian far right and Israel. So, so I'll, I'll save a comment on my own impressions of it. Um, I, I'm, I have very strong opinions about Brazilian foreign policy at the moment. <laughs> Um, I'll, 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 I'll save them for another time, but here's, here's what I can do, because at the end of your question, remind me your name too? Amanda. Amanda, thank you so much, Amanda. At the end of your question, you, you expressed a, a very health, a, an additional healthy question, which was, isn't the far right anti-Semitic? So how are they, they pro-Israel? So uh, instead of responding with my own opinion, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. One thing we've seen in Europe, um, in Sweden, which is really my geographic area of specialty, um, is, is that the Israel can be used as a lens to map the far right because opinions on Israel vary dramatically within the far right. Um, you have hardcore neo-Nazis who think Jews are the source of all evil, they're the reason my shoes are untied right now, and anything that a Jew touches needs, needs to be condemned. Um, that's a relatively small group, though, actually. You have another sector. Let's say if, if that's the extreme, we'll move in toward the center. You have another sector that can be pro-Israel on the grounds that Israel is an ethno-state, and Israel is the type of society that they want to have in Europe, um, which is relatively homogenous in terms of identity and, and religion and culture. Right? Um, and so you end up getting a sort of philo, not, not philo-Semitism per se, but a, but a love of Israel um, by, by that group. Um, you can also, in, in that territory, see people who say, yes, Israel is an ideal society, an ethno-state, the type that I want to make Denmark, uh, you know, or France, um, but Israel still at the same time, while guarding its own purity, creates ethnic chaos for the rest of the world. They're behind all the wars that are going on, they're behind all this stuff that has created mass movements of people, they, you know, they tried to bring down Assad, they, they urged Erdogan to, to create immigration into Europe, so, um, so they want ethnic peculi peculiarity for themselves and they want the rest of us to be turned into a mixing pot. So then you get an anti-Semitism expressing itself and registering in a particular character um, relative to Israel. The, the most moderate wing of the far right, of what I would still call the far right, um, can have uh, philo-Semitic and, and similarly, though not, not, exactly, not exactly the same thing, pro-Israel pro sentiment for two different reasons as I see it. One has to do with a particular guy, Netanyahu. It has to do with enthusiasm for Israel's version of the global strongman. Um, you see Erdogan in Turkey, you see Trump in the United States, Bolsonaro in, in Brazil, um, Orban in Hungary, and, and, and Netanyahu in Israel. And so enthusiasm for Israel's manifestation and in incarnation in this global trend brings it, um, brings it celebration. The other, the trickier one to deal with, is a far right that is anti-Muslim and anti-immigrant on liberal grounds, ostensibly. That, is sad, that they claim that they, in Europe, in the case of Europe, don't want to see Muslim uh, migration, don't want to see um, uh, Islam germinating within Europe's borders because it is hostile to women, because it's hostile to democracy, because it's hostile to sexual minorities. Um, and those voices typically are, are very, very pro-Israel. Gert Wilders in, in Holland is one example, the, the Dutch Freedom Party, this blonde-haired guy, if you know what he looks like. Um, he loves Israel, and he sees is Israel as being a sort of satellite of European values uh, against the barbarians of the Middle East. Um, so it's a celebration of Israel on liberal grounds, but the product of it is also a condemnation of a, of a very, very large number of people. So to give you a map of how those, how those, those views can vary within the far right. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, uh, hello, thank you. Uh, my name is Alexander. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. And actually, I have no comments or big questions right now, but you, but you posed many questions to me also. 
Uh, however, I have uh, one question. I'm a visiting researcher here. I came from Russia. And uh, um, in Russia, we have a very long tradition of oppression, of freedom of speech. And uh, in Russian culture, language, the mediator, is uh, the source of freedom. Because uh, we use language, Russian poets, writers, uh, singers very nowadays use language as uh, the tool for freedom. In this regard, Russian would say that uh, things that are uh, suggested by uh, Elon Musk would limit freedom. So what about uh, your research? Have you tried to put your ideas or ideas that you develop or elaborate on in different contexts, institutional or cultural ones? Mm, this is a dobra utra. Bashoy spasiba. It's uh, at, at the end, you ask kind of where where, where I've examined these ideas. If I, if I can work with that that question, um, I haven't published much on this in my in my last book. This question came up specifically in regard to Russia, um, and it was it was an interview I did with Alexander Dugin, um, and he. He talked about, he said that during the late Soviet era, uh, the, only, the only space where he felt completely free, it was actually, it was not the written word, it was, it was in the, the privacy of his mind. It was, it, it was in his own thoughts, and that also gave way eventually to a love of esotericism. Um, that might express itself with words, and in his case it did. He published a lot of words. Um, but they were, relating back to the Eric Satie question, they were strange words. <laughs> they weren't really word words. Um, it, it was poetic, it was, it was words whose meaning was meant to exist outside of their pure denotational content. Um, you were to find their meaning outside of the meaning of the words. The words were simply there as guideposts. Um, so that's that's what I I, th I think of in the first case, that, and it, it's a problem I think for, let's say for Elon Musk, that that words can function in that way, that language functions in that way, um, that that oftentimes, perhaps more often than not, words are poetic. You know, poetic might be actually the baseline of of linguistic communication rather than prose. Uh, in, in music studies, it, we're very, very accustomed to exploring the question, how language-like is music? How does language, how does music look like, function like language? Oh, you know, can we have a grammar of music-like language? But recently some people have been saying, no, we should be asking the opposite question. How music-like is language? Uh, because so often music, uh, language seems to operate on all of these extra cues, and that's the actual source of its communication. So when, when Elon Musk talks about needing to get beyond suggestion, needing to get beyond gesture, all of these imprecise features of language, someone could contend, well, that's the actual stuff, right? That's, that's the stuff, and you need the words in order to, to get that process started. But once someone is able to communicate in that way, they're communicating it with, with a tremendous amount of richness that perhaps a computer can't, can't get to. My initial thoughts. I want to ask a very naive question. No such thing. <laughs> Just to get the level lower. No, no, no. It's, uh, I was thinking, what are you... Uh, what are your thoughts about uh, how can democracy go against all this? Because in a world where where we are now, uh, dominated by social media, how could like a uh, anti movement to that to this uh, far right and all this way to manipulate people? How do you see that? I think. I think a reformulation, I, I think attaching ourselves to the local is one sense. Mm -hmm. A lot of what you hear from people, I think it's manifest in these case studies, I think it's manifest in others looking at the far right. A lot of what you hear is people feeling powerless and striving after some tool to make sense of a situation around them that they don't understand and they feel at, at pains to control. Um, we can 
regain control of some parts of our lives, and, and, and I think that is to turn, to turn inward. Um, a, a little bit to turn local. We, you have you have more power to control the ecological impact in a local space. Um, you have more power to control politics in a in a space. That's not a solution to everything. I don't have a grand solution, but but it's something. Um, the challenge that is facing, I think, anyone operating in a democratic, liberal democratic, as we say in an English in in, in English. Uh, in a liberal democratic world is that we, we want to be free and we want to belong to something. And we want to feel like we have some say and some power and it's very hard to combine all of those things. Mm -hmm. So, I guess we're done because, I mean, you have, I don't know how many questions. And so thank you so, so much for being here. Thank you, the Institute Brazil Israel, or Israel Brazil, I don't know the, the order, for bringing uh, Professor Teitelman, and thank you all for coming. Thank you, great questions. See you.